I think it would be well that I should read again the words that are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Romans in chapter 9 from verse 6 to verse 13. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel that are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, most of you will remember that we've worked our way through the details of that argument. There's only one argument there, and the argument is on this theme, that they're not all Israel that are of Israel. And the apostle, you remember, works out his argument to demonstrate that by citing two cases. The first case is the case of the two sons of Abraham. The second case is the case of the two sons of Isaac. Now, we saw that in both cases he adopted the same process of argumentation. He states the facts. He quotes a direct, explicit statement of God, and he deduces his own doctrine. Now, he's done that in both these particular cases that he cites. Last Friday night, we were looking at the second case, these two children of Isaac. And he emphasizes this most important point, that they were twins, that they were together in their mother's womb, that nevertheless one was actually, of course, born a short time before the other, but that God's choice was that the one who was born second is the one who is to be preferred, is the one who is to be the seed. Now, we saw that, we emphasized the facts, and we dealt with these two quotations of explicit statements made by God. And then we ended by just showing that he lays down this very vital bit of doctrine in verse 11, the verse that is found in brackets. And there, the key statement is that... Um, this happened because this was the only way whereby the purpose of God, which works itself out through the process of election, might stand. That, we found, was the key doctrine and the thing to emphasize. Well, now then, having gone carefully and quietly through the actual statements, we are now in a position to draw certain conclusions. We are able to draw conclusions with regard to this second case cited, the case of the two sons of Isaac, and we're also in a position to draw conclusions with regard to the whole section, the argument which begins at verse 6, and which is to prove that they are not all Israel that are of Israel. That's the thing which he sets out to prove. Well, now, then, it's most important that we should draw these conclusions because it is most important that we should be clear as to what the Apostle is saying. If we are not clear about this, we cannot possibly understand the section that follows. That's the one that everybody is familiar with. That is the one which undoubtedly many people have had in their minds and are straining at the leash to get on to. But not this year. You wait till 1963. Uh, but my point is that um, you'll never understand that. You'll never understand that unless you understand this. That arises out of this. So that we must be clear and certain in our minds as to what the Apostle is saying here. Now, judged by any standard, this is a most important statement. Not only that, we do know that it is uh, an extremely difficult statement. We're not handling an easy portion of Scripture here. It's a very difficult one. I hope none of you are discouraged by that. Don't blame yourselves if you have found this difficult to follow. 
it is one of the most difficult statements in the whole of the scripture. Don't be discouraged. But on the other hand, don't give up. Don't say, because it's difficult, I can't be bothered. You should never say that about any portion of scripture. A Christian man or woman who doesn't apply what mind and understanding he or she has got to a portion of scripture because it is difficult is sinning very grievously. You have no right to neglect any portion of God's word. But you say, this is a very controversial one. And people are arguing and have argued about it. And I don't want to be involved in argument and disputation. You have no right to back out of argument. Whatever God has given us, he has given us. And we are meant to apply our minds to it. Whether it is comparatively simple or whether it is comparatively difficult, as this is, we have no right to ignore scripture. And if we do, we do so at our peril. And it is indeed an insult to God who raised up men to write these very scriptures for our instruction, for our enlightenment, for our establishment in our most holy faith. Very well then. We've got to consider it. This seems to me to be one of the great causes of trouble in the church at the present time. Christian people have become lazy. They pick and choose in the scriptures. They have their favorite passages. And they evade the others and avoid them. And thus there is great ignorance concerning certain fundamental and vital and essential doctrines. There is nothing more glorious than this. That's partly why it is so difficult. Very well, then, I say, we must apply ourselves to it. But we must do so, of course, in the right spirit. We must be humble. We must be ready to learn. Now, let me add one other thing. What we are doing is to try to understand what the Apostle Paul said. That's all we are trying to do. I'm not here giving an elect a lecture on election. I'm not doing that. I am here trying to expound and understand what the Apostle Paul has actually written. Now, some of you want to go off into an argument on election. On both sides, I know. I've already heard some of you. I'm not here to do that. I am here to try to discover what the Apostle Paul said. If you like at the end to disagree with him, that is your responsibility. My responsibility is to make clear and plain, as far as I can, what the Apostle has actually said. And I do appeal to you to listen to him before you begin to talk about your own opinions. Isn't that generally the trouble in most arguments? You watch the next time you see two people having an argument. You just sit and listen and watch them. And you'll notice this, that really neither is listening to the other. He's waiting for the other to stop. Indeed, he's ready to interrupt him. That's precisely what so many people do with the scriptures. They've never really allowed the scriptures to speak to them. They're so anxious to give their opinion. Now be wise, my friend. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Make sure that you know what he's saying. And then you'll be able to follow his, his great argument as he develops it from verse 14 onwards. All right, all that's by way of introduction. We now, I say, are in a position to draw conclusions and deductions. In other words, I'm going to try to summarize what the Apostle is saying to us in these most important verses. One, the promise and the purpose of God have respect only to certain people. This is as true of the nation of Israel as of anybody else. Now, that's just another way of saying they are not all Israel that are of Israel. That was the fatal wrong assumption of the Jews. That was the reason why ultimately they crucified the Son of God himself. They hadn't realized that. The promise of God is not universal, not even universal about Israel, about the Jews. It is only to certain people. Second, these people to whom the purpose and the promises of God apply, they are and they become what they are not because of anything in themselves. They are the people of God. They are this seed that Paul talks about. Not because of their birth. Not because of their nationality. Not because of anything that they do. Not even their believing the gospel. They are what they are because God calls them into being. 
because of the supernatural element in their birth. Now, I'm summarizing what we've been considering in detail. Now, let me give you my authority for that particular summary. It's to be found in Galatians 4, verses 28 to 30. Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Remember, the apostle is here writing to Gentile Christians, puts himself as a Jew in with them. We, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so is it now. Those are the two important verses, 28 and 29. Very well, then, I say that these people are what they are and they become what they become, not because of anything in themselves, any more than Isaac became what he was because of anything in himself, but because simply God called him into being as he calls all Christians into being by this spiritual birth to which the apostle there refers, born after the spirit, not after the flesh only. That's the second. So the third way of putting the, the case is this. God's purpose, in other words, is being carried out and always has been and always will be by means of this process of election or selection. Now that's, of course, stated quite clearly in the 11th verse. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That's it. God carries out his purpose, says the apostle, by means of this process of selection or election. He did so in the case of Isaac, chose Isaac, didn't choose, rejected Ishmael. He chose Jacob, he rejected Esau. Now, that's God's way, says the apostle, of bringing his purpose to pass, making sure that it stands. It is by means of this process of selection and election. Now, I'm simply telling you, in other words, what the apostle is saying here. So the fourth way I put it is this, that God does bring his purpose to pass and carry it out by means of this process of selection and election for one reason only. It is this. It is the only way which guarantees that his purpose and his plan will certainly and surely and infallibly be carried out and brought to a final fruition. That, in order that the purpose of election, the purpose of God according to election, might stand, that is why he does it like this. It is the only way to guarantee that the purpose shall be carried out. If God's purpose depended at any point upon us, it would inevitably fail. It does not depend upon us at all. It depends upon God himself, his character, his action, and that makes it absolutely certain and sure. Now, of course, I need scarcely remind you that in putting it like this, the apostle is simply putting in a summary form what he argued at length from verse 28 to the end of the chapter in the previous chapter. That was the whole point there, that God's purpose is certain and sure. Who can, he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring anything any charge against God's elect. It is God the just, and so on, right away to the very end. And the triumphant conclusion, in all these things we are more than conquerors. And he's persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the thing. It's the purpose of God. He's carrying it out himself, Nothing can ever frustrate it. So God, he says here, does it in this way through this process of election and selection in order 
that it may stand, that it may never fall, in order that it always may be sure. Now then, those are the main conclusions. But there are certain aspects of this which I'm anxious to emphasize in particular, because they're emphasized by the Apostle. Now these special things are these. Here's the first. In, in a sense, it's just another way of putting the same point. God's choice is absolutely free and sovereign. It is quite and entirely independent of us, of anything we are or anything we do. God's choice is determined by one thing only, and that is by God's own character, his own nature, his own being, his own eternal will. You notice the phrase used by Paul there in the beginning of the epistle to the Ephesians, according to his own will. He keeps on repeating that. It's according to his own will. It's the only explanation. We are given no other. God's choice is absolutely free. It is entirely sovereign. It doesn't depend upon anything in us. It is entirely a matter of God's own eternal will. It is his choice and it is his alone. Now, all the cases, the two cases we've been looking at emphasized that completely, didn't they? The choice of Isaac was altogether the choice of God. It wasn't the choice of Abram. It was God's choice. We've seen in the story in Genesis what Abram's view was in the subject where he said, look here, here's Ishmael. Why don't you use him? No, said God, that's not my purpose. You see, it's entirely God. Isaac would never have been born if it hadn't been God's will. The whole thing is God. It's a free choice. It's a sovereign choice. Exactly the same with Jacob and Esau. It is altogether, as Paul goes out of his way, to remind us that the children not being yet born, neither having done good or evil, and then he rubs it home by saying, not of works, but of him that calleth. It's entirely in God and not in us at all. Now, that's got to be emphasized, because you'll not follow the argument that begins at verse 14 if you don't understand that. That's what Paul is saying. Whether you don't like it, that's, I'm not interested at all. I'm trying to tell you what Paul is saying, and that's what he does say, that it's God's free choice, and it is a sovereign choice. Secondly, this choice of God's involves a rejection as well as a choosing. Esau have I hated, as well as Jacob have I loved. Now, we interpreted that last week. God doesn't so much hate the person as hate the sinful condition of the person, the sinful attitude of the person, and all that that's going to lead to. God, as we are told in the Sermon on the Mount, causeth his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth his reign on the just and the unjust. This is from the standpoint of his view of sin and of man in sin. So there is a rejection as well as a selection. God hates evil. God hates sin. That's the second principle. Now then we come to what to me is the most important. The third. This choosing and electing and selecting on the part of God is something that we must view in the right way. In other words, in the way in which the Apostle puts it before us. What is it? Well, now then, this I say is so important because so many people, it seems to me, get into trouble over this whole doctrine because they don't view it as the Apostle puts it, but they view it in a wrong way. Now, this is how so many of them view it. Let me put it like this. According to the Apostle's teaching, God's electing and selecting is not a matter of an arbitrary selection out of a mass of humanity. It isn't the case of God looking at a number of mass of people and choosing some out of them and rejecting others. Now, I'm sure that many have always thought of it like that, that God is confronted by a great mass of humanity and that what the apostle is teaching here is this, that God looks at that mass of humanity and says, I am going to choose some of them, and I'm going to forgive them and give them salvation, I'm going to reject the others. I am asserting that that is not what the Apostle says. 
And that to think that is to misunderstand what he is saying. Very well, let's go on. I put it like that because I think both the cases that the apostle has used prove that that is not what God does. Well, what does he do? That both cases prove this. That God doesn't look at a mass of humanity and take out some and leave the others. What God does is to produce a people for himself. Now, I showed you that it was God who produced Isaac. It was a miraculous birth. It wasn't a case of Isaac and Ishmael being born and God looking at the two and saying, I'm going to take this one and not that one. That's quite wrong. God produced Isaac because he had already decided that it was through this man whom he was going to produce that the seed was to be carried on. So we must get rid of this notion of God looking at a humanity or a collection of people who have already arrived and then taking out one and leaving another. It isn't that. This is a very positive process. Now, the apostle, I say, has made that perfectly clear in the case of Isaac and then in the case of Jacob in exactly the same way. He cited the two cases because they both established that point. But later on in the chapter, he makes it quite clear again. Look with me at verse 24 where he puts it like this. Uh, He's got this comparison, you see, showing how, let's start at verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might know the, that he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy, listen, which he had afore prepared, Unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now, the operating, operative phrase is this, which he had afore prepared unto glory. He had prepared them beforehand unto this glory. That's what he's saying. It's in exactly the same thing as he's told us in the cases of Isaac and of Jacob. He had prepared beforehand these people for this glory. There it is quite plainly in that verse. And you've got the same thing really in verse 29, where he quotes Isaiah. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom, and we had been made like unto Gomorrah. It's God who preserves the seed. It's God who always brings this seed into being and preserves it. If the Lord of Sabaoth hadn't done this, it wouldn't have been there at all. It is God who prepares beforehand. It is God who prepares and maintains the seed. That is another way of saying what the Apostle I say has put so plainly before us in the two cases that he has cited. Very well. Both the cases, I repeat, prove that it is not a matter of an arbitrary selection out of a mass of humanity but it is rather a matter of God producing a people for himself. It is all determined beforehand, and we are produced to our Christians to that end and as a part of that purpose. Very well. In order to elucidate this, to make it still more plain and clear, I want to suggest to you that the right way of looking at this statement is to take it in terms of what he's already told us in chapter 5 from verses 12 to 21, which I read to you at the beginning for that reason. This is how he puts it. All humanity was in Adam, who was also the representative of the whole of humanity. That one man was humanity. And God dealt with him, and through him he dealt with the whole of humanity. It was all in him, and he was our representative. Very well. Adam fell, and the whole of humanity fell with him. Now, that's the explicit statement of verse 12 in chapter 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Now, We went into that in great detail several years ago. And you see 
the importance of doing things thoroughly. I'm in no difficulty about chapter 9 because of our careful interpretation of what's gone before. Having seen the thing stated so plainly there, there's no difficulty here. But if you hadn't grasped that, you're bound to be in trouble here. Well, now then, what's he say? Well, Adam fell, and all humanity fell with him. So that this is the position. All humanity is lost in Adam and is under the wrath and the condemnation of God. We can go further. We can say that all are rejected in Adam. All, because all have sinned in Adam's sin. Now, that is the position of everybody who has ever been born after Adam from one standpoint. What is God's way of salvation? Well, God's way of salvation is this. It is not so much to select people out of the fallen race of Adam for salvation. That isn't God's way of salvation at all. What is God's way of salvation? God's way of salvation, says Paul in Romans 5, is to produce a new humanity in Christ. Did you realize that? Here's the whole key. Humanity has fallen in Adam. What's God's plan of salvation? Oh, not to take some of those and reform them. No, no. God is doing something entirely new. There is a new, a second man. There is a last Adam. Now, that's the whole teaching of Romans 5, and you've got the parallel teaching you remember in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus Christ is the second man. Adam was the first man, Jesus Christ is the second man. Adam was the first Adam, Jesus Christ is the last Adam. Very well. Jesus Christ is the first of a new humanity. He's the head of a new race. God's way of salvation is to produce a new race. It isn't a selection out of the old race. It is the production of a new race. In other words, we must always think of salvation, God's way of salvation, as a positive process. It is, I say again, not just a question of some of Adam's race being forgiven and others not. It isn't that at all. It's a new race, a new people, a spiritual people, produced by a spiritual birth. I go further. These people are brought into the world and are born and are prepared for that end and object. We've established that in the case of Isaac. Here it is repeated in this 23rd verse, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before prepared unto glory. They are produced and brought into being and brought into this world for that end and object. That is plainly the apostle's teaching. It is a positive process. It is the production of a new humanity. Don't think of it merely or primarily as something that is done to the old, lost, condemned, rejected humanity. It isn't that. It is the production of a new humanity. But wait a minute. Let's be clear about the place of the natural in all this. This is crucial. God does not do away with the natural. He uses it, but he intervenes in it in a supernatural manner. Both the cases cited prove that. You remember the case of the birth of Isaac, don't you? Abraham was 99, Sarah was 90. The question of having a child was a sheer impossibility. Yet they had a child. The natural process came into it. God used the natural process, but the supernatural came into it. A miracle was done on top of it. So God used the natural supernaturally and produced Isaac. My contention is that he always does that. We saw that he did exactly the same in the case of Jacob. We are all born, therefore, in a natural sense as the children of Adam. As Ishmael and Isaac were the natural children of Abraham, and as Jacob and Esau were the natural children of Isaac, we are all the natural children of Adam. But the teaching is that nevertheless, as Christians, we are all of us separated from our mother's womb in a spiritual sense. 
Now, the exact time when this spiritual fact is made manifest, the actual time when it is made manifest, is irrelevant. Let me show you what I mean. Take the case of the Apostle Paul. Now, here is a case that will illustrate it to perfection for us. Take the case of the Apostle Paul. What does he say about himself? Well, this is what he says in the first chapter of the epistle to the Galatians in verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the the heathen, and so on. Now notice what he says. He says that he had been separated from his mother's womb as a Christian, as a servant of God, and as an apostle. Right. But we all know that for a number of years... He was a persecutor, he was a blasphemer, he was an injurious person. He was reviling Christ, he was execrating his name, he was doing everything he could against him. But what he says is this, that though he was for so many years a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious person, nevertheless it was true that he had been separated from his mother's womb. He was by nature a child of Adam. But God, even in bringing that man into this world, had done this supernatural spiritual thing. It only showed itself in time on the road to Damascus. But it was there, he tells us, from the moment of his conception, from his mother's womb. Very well, now this is the most important point. What happened in the case of Isaac and of Jacob, I am arguing, happens in the case of every Christian. God produces this new humanity. He does it by using the natural process. He doesn't scrap that. He uses it. But he so acts in it and upon it and through it as to bring his own purpose to pass. The others, well, they're just left. Ishmael was just left as the natural child of Abraham. Esau was left as the natural child of Isaac. And all the unredeemed, the unsaved, the non-Christians are just left as they were, as the natural children and progeny of Adam. Very well. This thing, then, I say, appears to us to be entirely something that happens in time. But what happens in time is only the manifestation of God's great and eternal purpose. I mean this, that our being convicted of sin our repentance, our calling by the gospel, the changed life and so on, all that is something that happens to us in time and we say I was converted on such and such a date or at such a particular time or period. That's all right. That's nothing but the manifestation of it. That's Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. But the thing happens in his mother's womb. You go back. Certain things became obvious about Isaac and about Jacob at a given point in time. Yes, but the thing was determined before they were born. That's the argument of the apostle. So the natural is used by God in this way. And what Paul is trying to get us to see here is this, that we mustn't look at it from our natural angle in in terms of the time process. We must learn to look at it from eternity in the purpose and the plan of God. And so we will see how it works itself out. Well, now take again the statement of it that we have there in Ephesians 1, which we read at the beginning again, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chosen us for that before the foundation of the world having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. There it is again in a summary form. Now, that's what the apostle has been telling us about the two cases, the case of Isaac and the case of Jacob. He says this is true of everyone who is a Christian. We are all the children of Abram, the children of faith, We are all born in a spiritual manner, as was Isaac himself. But you know, there's a very interesting case of this in the Old Testament. It is the case of Jeremiah. Listen to Jeremiah putting it. Go to the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1. 
And uh, listen to this. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. That's when the thing came to him. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and to the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and to the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Isn't it an exact parallel? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God produced him for that purpose. It only actually happened in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Don't get mixed up with this time element. You see, the Son of God really began his public ministry at the age of 30, but he'd been sent into the world to do it. There were 30 years when people just looked at him and thought he was a man like everybody else. Suddenly he bursts forth in his ministry. Jeremiah the same. For all the years, nobody knew that he was to be this remarkable prophet of God. But God had... Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sent thee. You notice it is God who forms him in the belly. Of course. This is what he does with all his people. There is a statement of exactly the same doctrine there in the Old Testament. So I would put it like this to you. The saved, those of us who are Christian, are not merely people who have come into this world like everybody else and whom God has chosen out from the rest in order to save us. If you put it like that, it means that you're looking at it only in terms of time and the making manifest of God's purpose. God actually brought us into the world through the natural process in order that we might become a part of this new humanity in Christ. For years, we appear to be exactly like everybody else. And yet, according to this teaching, we were always different. We didn't know we were different. Nobody else knew that we were different. Jeremiah didn't know that he was different. Isaac didn't know. Jacob didn't know. These things are not known. Nevertheless, it is still the fact. Christian people were never exactly equal and identical with others. There was always this difference. Not yet manifested, but it's there. From the foundation, before the foundation of the world. Before our mother's womb, even. There was always this difference. Looked at naturally, no difference. Ishmael and Isaac, both sons of Abram. Jacob and Esau, both sons of Isaac. Apparently no difference, and yet a vital and an essential difference that is made manifest. So it is, I say, with all who are Christians. According to the flesh, according to nature, we are all the children of Adam. And yet we are not only the children of Adam. We are children that God has produced and brought into being in order that this purpose and plan of his might be carried out in us. There is a spiritual element in us, not yet shown, not yet made manifest. That will happen later in time, but it's there. And God has brought us into being for that express and particular purpose. So I say we must get rid of this notion that God, as it were, looks down upon a mass of humanity and then in an utterly arbitrary and unfair way says, I'm taking this one and not that one, though they're both equally sinners and though they're both equally hopeless. That is not the way to view salvation according to the apostle. It must be viewed more positively. God has to produce a new humanity. He does it through the mechanism of the old humanity coming down from father to son as he does in these two cases. But the vital thing is the new humanity, the new production, so that there is no cause for complaint. No one has a right to say anything. 
All humanity in Adam is condemned and deserves to be, as Ishmael and Esau were. And such do not desire God and are not interested in God and are God-haters. There is no complaint. It is not an arbitrary selection. It is God producing something quite new and in a sense irrespective of the old humanity except that he uses the natural process of birth to bring his purpose to pass. Very well. I summarize it all up by putting it like this. The purpose and the promises of God apply only to those people whom God has produced for himself by a spiritual birth. That's what the apostle says. He leaves it, he leaves his evidence at that point. He could have gone on. He just gives us the two cases. They're enough, of course. He's established his case to the hilt. He just gives the case of Isaac and the case of Jacob. But what God did in those two cases he's gone on doing, you can see it in the Old Testament. He could have gone on to say this. Out of the twelve sons of Jacob, God selected Judah and not the other eleven. Out of this house of Judah, he then selected the house of David in particular. In other words, this process of selection is to be found running right through the, whole, the Old Testament. That's what makes the genealogical table so fascinating. They are there to show us God's process and purpose worked out through election. It's fascinating. You, have you been reading recently, some of you, the book of Ruth? You watch it there. You see what God did there to produce the men from whom Obed, the father of David, was finally to be produced. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. Look at the book of Ruth and see how God did it. You see, this is God's action altogether, and you can't explain it in any other way whatsoever. God uses the natural, yes, but he comes in in this miraculous manner to produce his people. And so, he is producing the new humanity. Now, I do trust that this has been made plain and clear to you. We've got to leave it at that point. I want you to meditate about this, and in this way. But check my exposition. Check my exposition. Remember that this is the test of any exposition of these verses 6 to 13 in Romans 9. The exposition must lead to the question that is asked in verse 14. And if it doesn't, it's a wrong exposition. The question is this, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? So that as you are checking my exposition... Make certain that your exposition, if you don't agree with mine, leads to that question. Whatever this interpretation of this statement is, it must lead certain people to say, very well, then if you say that, if Paul says that, there is unrighteousness with God. Now then, think about it in those terms. Go through the cases again, watch what he says. Notice these extraordinary expressions. This is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. God said that. Go back, turn it up in Genesis, read all about it. Do the same with the case of the two children of Isaac and of Rebekah. Take this great statement that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth. Any exposition has got to give full weight to all these statements. And I suggest to you that there's only one way to interpret it. It is the one that I've attempted to put before you this evening. God is producing a new humanity. And he does so by making use of the natural processes of birth, but of so intervening supernaturally in that that he guarantees the production of this people, this seed, so that at the end there will be a perfect humanity, complete and entire, in Christ, 
He is the head, we are the body. He is the firstborn amongst many brethren. Something entirely new. He is the second man. He is the last Adam. That is how God saves. That is God's plan of redemption. Doesn't it help you to understand the incarnation as you've never done before? Isn't taking out of the old mass of humanity and doing something to it. It's the production of something entirely new. Well, may God give us understanding in this glorious mystery. And may he so apply it to us that we shall be lost in a sense of wonder and of love and of praise. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we do indeed hasten to offer our praise and our thanksgiving, our sense of wonder and of marvel and of astonishment. O oh Lord, what amazes us most is that we are in this because of thy grace and because of thine own inscrutable will, according to the purpose of thine own will. Oh, give us grace, we pray thee, ever to look at ourselves and to think of ourselves in this way. Oh, forgive us for the folly of detracting from what thou hast done, even detracting from what thou hast made us because of our puny understandings. Lord, grant that we may know more and more that we have the mind of Christ, Enable us by thy spirit to think in that way, we pray thee, and according to that mind. And then we know that thine and thine alone shall be all the honor and all the glory. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us. Now this night, during these coming days and weeks, until we meet again, if it be thy will, throughout the remainder of this hour, short and certain earthly life and pilgrimage, and until we enter into that eternal glory for which thou hast beforehand prepared us in Christ Jesus. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.